Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Ah, this morning I am speaking on the Divine Feminine. And I wanted to give a talk exploring the feminine face of God and how the feminine face of God has been experienced and expressed in many different cultures all the world over for many thousands and thousands of years. Having a feminine face of God was not only deeply important for me personally in my own life, but it is deeply important for us all, for men and women alike. When we celebrate the sacred feminine, we think about the qualities of love and wisdom and justice and beauty and harmony and compassion. They are the qualities that have traditionally been identified with the divine feminine. And long, long before there was a patriarchal view of God as father that came forth when the monotheistic religions came forth with Judaism and Islam and Christianity, there was for thousands of years the honoring and the worship of mother goddess, of the universal mother, the mother as the creatress birthing all the worlds out of her infinite love and her consciousness. And for me, uh, in my spiritual journey, one of the most influ influential yogis um, and mystics and authors that I have read and that I have loved and I wish I could have met has been Sri Aurobindo. Sri Aurobindo uh, wrote extensively about the mother. He has this wonderful little book called The Mother. It's my favorite of all little books. And in it he writes, he writes, the mother is the consciousness and force of the supreme and far above all she creates. And there are three ways of being of the mother of which you can become aware when you enter into the oneness with the conscious force that upholds us and the universe. And then he, gr he goes on to describe these three ways of the mother, these ways of the mother. And the first is the transcendent mother, which is the original supreme Shakti, which links creation, the world of form, to the ever unmanifest mystery of the supreme. And so a few months ago, I was speaking on the energy body. I gave a series on the ener energy body, and I was talking about the energy that flows up the spine and how it's often called Shakti. Well, the Shakti is spiritual energy. And Aurobindo says that when we cultivate our spiritual energy, when we cultivate the Shakti and we have a lot of Shakti, it links us to the unmanifest, to the mystery of the Supreme. When we pray, when we meditate like we just did, you know, when we chant, when we give all our attention to our connection with the divine, we get absorbed. We get absorbed sometimes and we don't want to speak. And that's because we're feeling that Shakti. We're feeling that spiritual energy. And we want that to percolate. You might notice that after a prayer, after a meditation that spiritual energy. Aurobindo then describes a second way that we connect with the mother as the universal mother. And he writes about the universal mother. He says, she creates all beings, enters them, and supports them. You know, in that song I just sang, Holy Mother, I sing, you know, Holy Mother, my heart longs to be free. Holy Mother, dissolve me into thee. Dissolve me into thee. And this is what is possible for us all. And this is what we do in our spiritual practices all the time is we give ourselves over to that. We open and become receptive to that. And then we wait in the silence and we let that have us. We dissolve ourselves into a greater, more expansive consciousness. And if we can live from that, stabilize in that, act from that, speak from that, think from that, create from that, then we are embodying the universal mother and her expans expansive consciousness. So she creates, she enters and supports her creation. And when we sincerely call to her, when we want to know her, when we have a longing to know her, she comes, she comes 
and we are filled with grace. We have the light of wisdom in us, and we feel the bliss. We feel the peace. Ah, a, a really obvious expression of the universal mother creating and then entering and supporting form is our mother earth. You know, the mother creator poured herself into this amazing form of a planet that gives and gives and gives and sustains us every day. And so many of the ancient spiritual traditions deeply felt their oneness with the Mother Earth. Native American traditions in particular, they express their oneness and feel the oneness with the Mother um, in so many of their prayers. Let me read you something Chief Seattle wrote, it's something I really love from him. He writes, every part of this earth is sacred to my people. Every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every meadow, every insect, all are holy in the memory and experience of my people. We know the sap that courses through the trees as we know the blood that courses through our own veins. We are part of the earth and it is part of us. Hmm. We sense that the, the Universal Mother created out of herself this beautiful planet and all the beings of this planet, which include us. So Aurobindo goes on to describe the third way that we connect with the Mother, and that is with the individual embodied Mother. She embodies those other two aspects. She is filled with spiritual energy with Shakti, and she is also one with the Universal Mother, awake to the Universal Mother energy. And so Aurobindo says that she, she comes into form and lives near and dear to us. And we've had many well-known embodied divine mothers throughout history. Um, gosh, there's, there's too many to name, but Isis. Isis is a well-known one. Kuan Yin, uh, the Virgin Mary, the Green Tara Buddhism, Durga, Kali, Maheshwari, um, Saraswati, there are so many. And then there are ones that are more recent. Uh, Ananda Mayuma, she lived in the early 1900s. Um, and we have Amma, Amma the Hugging Saint, who is here now. We have Mother Mira, who is, I, I feel, an embodiment of the Divine Mother. And you know, some of you may know that Amma, whose full name is Mata Amrita Nandamayi, which means Mother of Immortal Bliss. She has been probably my most important spiritual teacher, certainly my primary spiritual teacher for the last 30 years. And um, I'll share more about, about that. That actually could, could be a whole talk or many talks, but I'll share more about that in a minute. But I want us to consider how this trinity of the mother that Aurobindo describes, these three ways to connect and know, know the mother, how similar they are to the trinity in Christianity. The Shakti, the spiritual energy, is it's similar to the Holy Spirit. It is, you could say, the same as the Holy Spirit. And then the Universal Mother, the Creatress that brought all creation into being, you could say she's very much like the Father in the Trinity. And then the embodied form of the Divine Mother, well, that sounds a lot like the Son or Jesus in the Christian Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've got the the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you've got the, the, the Universal Mother, the Embodied Mother, and the Shakti. So it's just, I thought it was so interesting how similarly these trinities are. And just as the Son in the Christian Trinity experiences one, oneness with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the Embodied Divine Mother experiences oneness with the Shakti and with the Universal Mother. And I want to say that the energy of the Universal Mother, it, it is not exclusive to women. You know, it's, it's, it's just like, you know, praying to God the Father is not an exclusive thing for men. There are many great yogis that have prayed with such longing to the Divine Mother that they have had these mystical experiences of union. Um, Yogananda writes beautifully about his experiences with the Divine Mother. In fact, he 
he wrote that song, Divine Mother, that's on my CD from, gosh, 1995. Um, but I love that chant. And also Ramakrishna, another uh, one, one of India's famous, most famous yogis. He merged in the Divine Mother and writes amazingly about it. If you read even the Pope, the current Pope's uh, prayers to Mary, I, I recently found some prayers from Pope Francis this week where he's, he's praying to Mother Mary. And you can feel this deeply personal relationship that he has with her as an aspect of the Holy Mother. Um, Alma gave a speech at the United Nations. She was asked to speak on universal motherhood, the universal mother and universal motherhood. And she, she said, the essence of universal motherhood is not restricted to women who have given birth. It is a principle inherent both in men and women. It is an attitude of the mind. It is love. And that love is the very breath of life. For those in whom motherhood has awakened, love and compassion towards everyone is as much a part of their being as breathing. That's pretty powerful, you know, when love is, is as much part of our being as breathing, that we breathe in love, we breathe out love, and we are love embodied. And it is the truth of who we are when we fully, um, when we fully, fully manifest our divinity. Um, I had a life-changing experience um, back in 1991. I was living at Brighton Bush Hot Springs up in Oregon, and my job was leading spiritual practices all day long, every day, living in the old growth forest, soaking in hot springs, and um, it was really the perfect environment to have a spiritual awakening, and I had no idea it would happen. But um, I had been praying this one day. I had been praying intensely in the sanctuary, and I, was, I had been meditating a few hours. And at, at that point in my life, I was praying a lot to Kuan Yin, to the mother. And I went into this very deep absorption. I really went into kind of a samadhi state. And I felt my mind just merge into this immensity of stillness. I had never known such stillness. And I felt this bliss, and I felt this peace, and I felt no identification with the body, with form. And I just felt that I could expand out into infinity, like all that I am was endless. And um, I had never known so much love. The energy of love was just so, so immense. And also an, a sense of omniscience, of, of knowing, of understanding. Um, and it was really dramatically life-changing. It changed me so much. <laughs> and after that experience, I basically went into silence for about a year. I got a cabin here in Mount Shasta, and I was basically in a silent retreat for about a year, integrating what happened to me. And after about a year, I had this really strong urge inside to find a teacher, to find the most enlightened teacher that I could find. And I found Alma. And um, it would take many, many talks to, to share, you know, gosh, that first meeting with Alma, which was amazing, and then just 30 years uh, touring with her and singing for her and watching her and learning so much. But I will, I'll give a talk on that another time, on those, those teachings, because there's so many, so many powerful teachings. But what I have seen Alma demonstrate and what she helped me do is integrate and understand, you know, what happened to me in that awakening experience. What I have seen in her and how she has helped me is that every single day she serves humanity. She sees everyone as a part of herself and she loves them and she serves them. And um, she's just tireless in her, her selflessness and um, her charities, her charitable work, it's just unparalleled. And her love is just immense. And so one of the things she often says is that we need the divine feminine in this world, that we need more love and compassion. We need more selflessness versus selfishness. And we need a deeper connection with our earth to heal our planet, 
to heal our divides. The, the, this country feels particularly divided. I don't remember it feeling ever this divided in my lifetime. We need the divine feminine energies. We need the love and the compassion. So I want to just briefly talk about what happened. What happened in our history where the divine feminine got written out, where it kind of got subjugated, it got repressed, and we ended up for a time with a stern God, you know, with a God that judges, with a God that, you know, says we are originally sinful versus originally sacred children of the Divine Mother. Um, Andrew Harvey is a friend of mine and uh, written some great books and he wrote a book called The Divine Feminine and he wrote that in the evolution of human consciousness during the Paleolithic and Neolithic eras, eras humanity lived instinctively as a child of the Great Mother and that Humanity lived in harmony with her body, which was all of creation, as the Native Americans write. But as humanity gradually developed the capacity for self-awareness and gained power to develop technology and to control the environment, man started seeing nature as something to struggle against and to overcome and to control and even to profit from. You know, and this is when a shift happened um, where the focus shifted from being on the goddess to the god. And it's where this split happened between spirit and nature. Before that, nature and spirit were intertwined. They were an integral part of spirituality. But Andrew writes that this loss of the divine feminine has, has endangered civilization. And it's reflected in our present climate crisis. You know, the, the drive for power over nature and using up natural resources for material gain is, is a present and really painful part of our evolution right now. And I mean, it couldn't be more stark and more noticeable than living here in California where, you know, we're having an up close and personal relationship with climate change, with the fires we had this summer that we've had every, almost every summer. Um, you know, on the drought and the, the, the record high temperatures. And Colorado just had their worst fire in history in late December. You know, really 20 years ago, you know, that was just unheard of. So humans are out of balance with nature. They're living out of balance. And what we need is a return to feeling our oneness with Mother Earth as part of our universal mother. Because when we feel at one with something, we take care of it. It's a part of ourselves. It's a, you know, we, we, we don't want to mow down the forest and pollute the rivers and the oceans. We want to take care of this incredibly life-giving planet, this only planet that we have. So Andrew writes with a sense of urgency and that we need to con connect. We need to return to our connection with the Universal Mother as a living presence within us and also within our Earth home. I would love to um, hear from you after service, but I would guess that most of us grew up with, a, with an image of God the Father. We probably were introduced to God as the Father. You know, our earliest conception might be <clears throat> that painting of uh, Michelangelo's, The Creation of Adam, where God has got the white flowing hair and the big long white beard and he's reaching out his finger and uh, Adam is reaching his finger to out towards God. You know, that, that's kind of the image of God I think a lot of us had growing up. But imagine, just for a moment, just for a moment, how different our concept of God would be had that been a Divine Mother figure with flowing white hair, reaching her finger out to the first created woman and the woman reaching back. If that's what everyone was uh, given as, as their concept of the divine, of the supreme being, it would be very different, be very different society. There are two powerful reasons that I think, at least two, that I think are really important to reframe our idea of, of God. And the first reason is that half of humanity is female, right? Women, 
women need to see a picture of the divine feminine to fully realize what we can become in our own spiritual evolution. And the other reason is that the divine feminine aspects of mercy, of love, of wisdom, of compassion and nurturing, those aspects are equally important to men as well as women. You know, men need to feel the presence of love no less than women. And men, you know, need this integrated feminine energy awaken themselves to feel whole. You know, it's been so unfair for men to you know, have been taught, you know, you got to be strong and not show your feelings. And, you know, that, you know, that, that just, you know, I think this, there's something happening in the evolution of men right now where they're, they're embracing their, their feminine nature as well, their softer nature, their intuitive nature. But to have a God without the qualities of love and compassion, it leaves you with that stern punishing God, right? That condemns, you know, humanity as sinners. I remember uh, in first grade, the nuns kind of scared me with that idea of God. <laughs> but our idea of God evolves as we evolve, right? And we, we realize how unhealthy that old idea of God really has been. You know, in all the unity churches I've toured over the years, I've met so many recovering Christians <laughs> who are so grateful they found unity and they found mother father God you know mother father God of love versus a judgmental and blaming and shaming God hmm. you know Jesus welcomed women he honored women he treated women as equals he was one with the God of love and his life was about healing and offering powerful teachings on love it wasn't until after he was gone that Christianity was formed remember he was he was a Jew and when when it started growing and being embraced by political leaders that's when there was this effort to turn whoever was worshiping the goddess or the mother or the earth to worshiping a male God, God the Father. So to deny the feminine face of God, it's like denying half of who we are. You know, it's, it's um, you know, losing the mother as, as an archetype, it's, it's losing so much, you know, it's losing so much. All mothers of this earth, human mothers and otherwise, give life. The mother is the life-giving, life-sustaining, um, aspect of creation. Another great writer on the divine feminine uh, is Rian Eisler. She wrote The Chalice and the Blade, one of my favorite books when I was in my 20s. Uh, but it's just still so, um, it's so important what she wrote. She's an archaeologist and she documents how humans for th many thousands of years lived in peace. They lived in a, actually an egalitarian society where it was equal men and women were equal, but they worshiped the goddess and there wasn't war. There was peace and there was art. And it wasn't until man created bronze that he was able to create weapons and then go to war to gain power over, you know, others and gain land. That's when we lost our way and the, the love of power um, overtook the power of love. And so, you know, in that lust for power, there was this repression and subjugation of the divine feminine. So I have a story uh, from Alma that describes just what I'm talking about. <clears throat> there once was a woman who lived in a village who found immense happiness in doing selfless service as service to God. And the religious leaders of the village chose her as one of their priests. And she was the very first appointed woman priest in the area. And the male priest didn't like it one bit. But her great compassion and her humility and wisdom were very appreciated by the villagers. And it caused a lot of jealousy among the male priest. Well, one day all the priests were invited to go out to a religious gathering that was out on this island. And it took about three hours to reach the island by boat. And as the priests all were boarding the boat, they discovered, to their dismay, that the woman priest was already seated on the boat. And they muttered among themselves, what a pain. She refuses to leave us alone. And the boat set off. But an hour later, the engine suddenly died, and the boat came to a standstill. 
and the captain exclaimed, Oh no, we're stuck. I forgot to fill the tank. And nobody knew what to do. There was no other boat in sight. And at this point, the woman priest stood up and she said, Don't worry, brothers. Don't worry. I'll go and fetch some more fuel. And having said this, she stepped out of the boat and walked away across the water. Well, the priests watched with great astonishment, but were quick to remark, look at her. She doesn't even know how to swim. <laughs> ah, the point of my story <laughs> is that our world really, really, really must wake up to the ways that the divine feminine is repressed, you know? Um, and we need those energies instead to be expressed, expressed. You know, that idea that a woman is somehow worth less or that she should cover her body head to toe or that she shouldn't have the same rights men have or be paid less or that she's able, less able to spiritually lead or less able to politically lead. This has to change because if we suppress the feminine, humanity suffers. You know, you see it everywhere the feminine is repressed. The, the, the society suffers there. The Dalai Lama has said many times that the awakened divine feminine is our hope for the future in both men and women. <coughs> but he's really big on empowering women leaders, which is pretty wonderful. And boys growing up and men need to be supported in developing emotional intelligence that, you know, comes with being encouraged to feel and express love and be intuitive and nurture, right? They need to um, integrate that divine feminine in their own being. You know, for me, when I, when I feel the energy of the divine mother, you know, when I feel it awaken me, which I do most, you know, when I sing, when I give concerts especially or in retreats, when I am fully in that energy, and I actually have been so in this energy this week, I've loved writing this talk, only that it's, it's been very hard to edit down. <laughs> but when I see and I feel with her energy, I just see with the eyes of love. You know, there's just this desire to help humanity. There's just this desire to help us become free of suffering. There's no judgment and there's no fear. There's just this enorm enormity of love. So I hope this talk uh, has been inspiring. I know maybe for some of you, the feminine face of God is, is it might be new, you know, but it's actually very ancient um, and it's deeply inspiring to explore. Um, and most of all, I really want to say that the grace of the mother, the grace of the mother is always available. As one of my, um, one of my songs I wrote on Mother's Song CD says, she loves her children. She wants your joy. So pick up your feet and dance. Sing out your heart. Take a chance. Live this life to love all you can and know that all is well. All is well. In her infinite love and compassion, we truly are always held. We are always held. And in that all is truly well. Hmm. May you, may you know that. May you know that all is well. May you feel that in your heart. And may you feel embraced in this infinite love that is always here. Thank you. God bless. God is blessed. <laughs>